Thanks for that. Um, I'm actually going to be quite short because we've got two farmers here and you want to hear what they're doing on their places. So in dryland hill country, basically clover's king, clover in spring. Um, for you guys who are in summer wet, it's a different issue, but in dry land, uh, it's all about annuals. Um, annual clovers in spring give a better lamb growth rates, earlier weaning. That drives the whole system. You're destocked before summer dry. Money in the bank and um, whatever takes you for relaxation. Rob's case, it's fishing. I know Tozzy's at the beach. Myself, it's at the beach. So <laughs> a bit more time off over summer. The annual clovers are really important. Perennial clovers, white and red, which we're all familiar with, grow in late spring and into summer, but in dry land, there's often not the moisture there to sustain um, the, the, the ryegrass or the denthonia or brown or whatever it is, has sucked the moisture out of the soil on the uh, northern faces. And by the time the white clover comes to grow, there's no moisture left and it often dies. So we see on our ridges, the northern faces, we get annual clovers. And we're talking about sub, some medics and um, a few little natives. But for most of us, it's sub clover. And those sub clovers are adapted to, to survive in dry land. They set seed in spring at various times in spring, then they die. And that seed sits in the soil for at least a year, generally and then it starts to germinate, and it can germinate over a long period of time. We know that we take out pine trees after 30 years, you start seeing some subclover coming back, so that hard seed can last a hell of a long time. This is an innovation farm program, and it's been going now for three years. It has to go for a long time because hard seeded clovers take a long time to set seed, break down, germinate, it's a long-term thing. So it's, it's going for three years and I think there's another year extension added on to the program now. There are three farmers, Pete Spinburn in Hawke's Bay, Rob Faulkner in Gisborne and Richard Tossel in the Wire Wrapper. And there are basically two parts to the program. The first is we're looking at some of these new erect annual clovers now, this work basically had its genesis at Castle Point with Malcolm McFarlane back in 2012, I think. He had some quite good success with getting arrowleaf going on a really, really dry, bony face. Um, so we're just looking to see how we can get arrowleaf into a farming system, and it's not easy. And the second is, can we change management of our subclover to get subclover dominance. What's happened over the last few decades is the drive for intensification, stocking rate meant that we've got a lot of set stocking going on on dryland hill country. And the biggest enemy of clover and subclover is a sheep. They will just hunt it out. So there's been a lot less seeding of subclover. And so now we find our clover contents have gone right down. So it's, can we change management to encourage, encourage clover content? So I'm talking about, on the left-hand side, that's arrowleaf. Um, it's, a, it's an amazing plant. It can produce 10 tonne on steep dry land. A vigorous cedar, but its real problem is that it's an aerial, it seeds up at the top, it flowers at the top of its stem. So if you stock it, it gets eaten. Um, but I'll, I'll go on to why we've been looking at arrowleaf and how we had hoped to manage it. And on the right hand side, you've got subclover, which is much smaller. Um, it flowers also in spring um, and it sets seeds as a burr. So the, the flowers put a burr which goes into the soil. And so it's a bit more resistant to, to grazing. Um, the old cultivars, Talarook and Mount Barker, uh, which the, the ecotypes of those have adapted quite well to grazing. They've been forced to over time, so they're very small plants. They set their flower very low and the burrs go down. The new cultivars, which have all come out of Australia, that's where they all come from, are much bigger. The plant's much bigger. The flowers are much further up and they flower early, which is a 
a bit of an issue because if they flower late, you get more grazing off it. If they flower early and you've got to try and you know, back off the grazing to set seed, it's a bit hard with all the pressure that comes on in early spring. Uh, I'll just run through um, Pete Swinburne's property and what um, he's doing there. Um, that's an arrow leaf um, crop on a hillside on a northern face and we had amazing success with this in its first year. Ten and a half tonne on a face which you know grows about four tonne. And it grew all that in spring. That was taken at the end of July, that picture. And was allowed to set seed and it set 1,500 kilos of seed to the hectare. Just unbelievable. It's sort of been all downhill from there. Um, the problems with this huge seed set and letting it set seed, because the idea is we want to get the seed in the soil so it'll keep coming up for the next 10 years and we get grazing off it. So that's why in the first year we try and back off the sort of short-term pain for long-term gain is the theory. Trash. So we re sowed our leaf the next year because we knew that we'd get nothing up because it's hard seeded. And the, basically because you've got trash there, it's got a very difficult seed bed for the establishing seeds, plus it's a haven for slugs. But three years down the track, this is the third year I think, um, you can see it's been so over so with plantain and you can actually see there's a lot of clover, arrow leaf clover coming up um, in the paddock. This was taken about 10 days ago. So the theory works, the Achilles heel is that it's so palatable that everything wants to eat it. And, and Rob will talk a bit more about slugs. Um, the other aspect of the project at Pete's is we surveyed his, his northern face, or one of his paddocks in 2000, November 16, and found half a percent clover, visual clover score. We just, we really struggled to find clover. So we thought, well, we, it's a bit hard to manage this one, there's nothing here to start with, so we did some over -sowing. We lifted that to 6% clover, and we thought that's still not very exciting after an over sowing program. Um, we did some herbage tests, and right down the bottom here is molybdenum, almost negligible. Now, mo is important in the rhizobia process, so we thought, well, this is actually what's happening here. The, the mo levels aren't allowing the rhizobia to function, and therefore the plants can't get established. So we set up a fertiliser trial, and this is actually at Richard Tossel's, but it's a much better photograph than the one at Pete's, so I've, so I've used it. And we did, as well as doing cuts, we did visual scores, a lot, a lot of visual scores. So you basically put a quadrat down, and you assess how much clover's in that quadrat. So that's probably 80% clover sort of an assessment you give that. So we did that across um, a large micronutrient trial, it was replicated. Long story short, um, no difference uh, with the treatments, control, um, potassium, phosphorus, sulfur, lime, or molybdenum. So that was about 10% visual clover in August. The only significant effect was 19% visual clover to the lime, mo, and sulfur combination. Same in October, um, no difference. No difference uh, across all the treatments, except for this lift here for Lyme, Mo and S. And once again, January, the same. So it's a bit puzzling, but we've at least we did get a response. We've now got to work out why we got the response to the combination and not to the, just to, to the mo. Uh, plan going forward, air relief to get the sowing right. Timing of sowing is, is really critical in these over-sowing programs. We have a, uh, we're all 
brought up on red, you know, white clover and, and ryegrass. Sow in autumn, get it in as soon as possible so you get autumn growth. That theory no longer works if you're sowing just clover. The clover actually doesn't do very much through the winter. Um, if you sow too early, you don't get rain, you, don't, you get a, a poor strike. What we've really found is that you want seed soil contact, you want mud. So if you sow later into the winter, you can get a successful establishment and it still does its thing. And in fact, the later you sow, the less weed competition you've got. Manage the slugs and trash. I won't uh, deal with that anymore. Um, Pete's also want to another go at over sowing subclovers into a very hard dry face and address why we aren't getting a clove response to molybdenum. I'll finish there and um, I'll hand over to Rob Faulkner who will tell you exactly what's been going on in his place in Gisborne. Cheers Paul. Um, you didn't think you were going to get me today but you have so I um, hope that's a bonus. Um, yeah, so we farm um, 600 hectares right on the, oh, just a uh, K from the coast um, south of Gisborne there, and we get um, 1,000 mils of rain, and probably eight out of 10 years that were um, summer dry. So um, you can see there we do sheep and beef and annual cropping and uh, a bit of citrus and a bit of farm forestry. Um, yeah, we can get bloody dry, and so uh, part of my motivation to... Um, Doing this trial is is um, so I can get as many lambs off mum, and um, and and draw some um, time off. Um, yeah, so I just put that photo up there that of our um, forefathers who, who um, broke in the land and and um, struggled to get their uh, crops growing initially, and and then we we moved to um, now, and it's. Um, Quite, quite a dramatic change, I think, and, um, and, and there's still plenty of opportunities going forward. Um, so, and part of our um, other rationale for doing the, these trials is trying so we can start, um, as I say, get more lambs off mum, but um, we've been sort of marginalised out of our better flaming um, flat country, our finishing country into the hills as our um, price of our flat land is just um, going through the roof. Um, Incidentally, on our flat land this year, we had uh, we um, got some uh, annuals and, and uh, a, little bit, a little bit of plantain in the mix, and um, and we managed to uh, crack gross six grand a hectare, which um, which is in an ideal growing season. It's just um, shows the potential of what can be done. Um, so we. Uh, Started off our trial actually before the uh, innovation program began. Um, thanks to um, in, Emily and Anders, what they were doing down there, and we thought, shit, this looks potentially like it's a go. So um, we launched into it, and um, and so we ran through. We did a spray in December and nuked it five liters a hectare of Roundup, and then came back in mid March and did it again. And so we, the idea was that we were conserving that moisture and would have a good seed bed. And um, yeah, so, um, and we got 57 plants a square metre, which we thought, you know, for the first crack, this is not too bad. And we um, put on the slug bait and, and um, planted on the 10th of April. Um, so, yeah, part of the thing was to increase weaning weights from 28 to 32, increase the um, ewe weaning weight from 63 to 67 and increase our stocking rate from seven to 10 ewes a hectare. Um, you can see there's some figures that sort of um, sort of back up that theory um, and the production gains um, that that we were aiming for. And uh, with that U one on the right there, that's based on a, um, all those ewes getting their heads cut off and the, um, the um, increase in benefits you can get from that. Um, which is, you know, on the face of it, it's quite substantial, really. Um, and then another opportunity as the trial went on that we saw was we harvested a block of pine trees, and we saw this as a um, 
opportunity as a blank canvas to try and establish uh, some subs into that um, into that um, forestry block. The idea, you know, the, the block's going to go back into forestry, and um, and the idea was that you know, might be able to establish clover in there and then plant the trees and then be able to graze under those trees to help offset the planting of the new trees in. And it was sort of a, a big unknown. And um, and you can see there we had no problem getting the clover going. It looked bloody marvellous. And we thought, we you know, this is uh, potentially pretty cool. And um, But what we found out is, is those clovers um, die off in the summer because they're annuals, that it opens it up for a, um, a seed bed for whatever bloody bird that's come and lived in those trees for 30 years and there's just, yeah, you know, we got serious weed problems um, that we didn't even foresee that were there. So um, probably probably not something that I'd recommend, but there's other, uh, I've got a lot of other, if you want to come see me, I've got some other ideas on that that um, might be a better way to tackle it. Um, yeah, so uh, slugs, uh, I sort of didn't, I knew they were a problem before I started this, this, these trials, but I didn't um, realise how much of a bastard of a creature they are. I really hate them, eh? I just, I just they, you can see some of the figures there, you know, that one slug can um, live for six years, have 90,000 grandchildren. You only see five percent um, that's above ground at any one time. Um, yeah, and then um, there can be up to five hundred and sixty odd thousand slugs a hectare. And um, you know they, you wouldn't believe them. They got twenty thousand teeth. Um, you know, and, and they um, they don't need a partner to um, to um, breed from. They can. Do their own thing, and um, yeah. So that they they are a critter that needs to be taken bloody seriously. When even if you're cultivating, um, we had a paddock this year that that um, of plantain and clover on the or clover and plantain um, on the flats, and we'd planted winter star beside it, and that, that clover paddock was um, had slug bait on it, in about the twentieth of March. Um, when we had quite a wet sort of grey autumn, you, you, we took out that population of slugs, and then that slug bait only lasts for six weeks. And you can imagine all those hundreds of thousands of eggs per hectare that are in there, just waiting to, um, and some of them will hatch during that six weeks while that slug bait's still in, on there, and they'll get nuked. And then once that slug bait runs out, you're bloody open to. Um, getting done again. So what did those slugs hatched after their six weeks? They migrate, they were in that crop of clover, they migrated out of that clover into the winter star next door. And I was looking and wondering why the hell at the bottom of this paddock, the 30 metres or so was decreasing and the little bastards were just in there. So um, yeah, quite a, quite a um, big lesson really. Um, yeah, and that's what I do um, when I've fattened all the lambs and can bugger off fishing. Uh, g'day everyone. Um, yeah, I'm Richard Toswell. Um, I've got a bit to get through, so I'm going to probably go a little bit quick so someone can tell me to slow down if I get carried away. But um, yeah, we're in the Wairapa. Uh, we farm Te Awa, Awa uh, 646 hectares. Um, we have a limited amount of cultivated we have been only 10% and uh, I think we, you know, we're classed as genuine hill country. Um, uh, winter wet, summer dry, 850 annual rainfall. Um, we run yet yeah, nearly 3,000 uh, Texel cross ewes and a pretty standard system with 100 breeding cows and replacement heifers. Uh, we mate everything, so hoggets and uh, heifers, everything's mated. Anything that doesn't get pregnant um, is sold or culled. Um, recently, over the last few years, just to try and bring a bit more flexibility into our business, we've um, added additional trading cattle and uh, sheep to try and, uh, I guess, just be uh, gentler on things, but also not, just not be at so much risk. 
Um, yeah, we, we, we're lambing around that 148 percent, and uh, an average weaning weight of 30 kilos. And um, I guess our our goal in this whole trial is similar to what Rob was saying, and trying to lift that by another two or three kilos to really um, take that sort of risk out of um, a dry summer and that type of thing. So um, yeah. Um, some of the key points um, with, with this trial, when we were approached about j joining um, uh, the other go uh, farmers that were doing this, we were pretty keen to not involve chemicals. Being summer dry, we felt that um, you might have one year where it pays off, but then the other ones you're going to be at really at risk with uh, weed infestation. And um, just in the little areas that we have done a bit of spraying or had um, the likes of the arrow leaf crop, we've seen a massive, massive explosion of, um, of thistles. We just seem to have a massive massive bank in there so um yeah we were pretty keen against that you know um done a lot of pole planting erosion prone and all those type of things just didn't really float our boat i think it's got a um, place in you know in your winter um safe uh, summer safe places but um not for us uh so the aim for those uh, to really lift the me across the whole property um and uh the main focus for us is when, when you look at the, uh, your farm well, when we look at our 646 hectares of that area, 35% is the area that we're really targeting as our strong sub-country. That's our drier faces. That's the stuff that's going to really um, be our, our strongest lambing country. You know, it's um, northern facing. So protected from the south, and that's the stuff that we can probably get all our twin use. Um, yeah, really trying to lift that weight, like I say, from 30 kilos up to 33 kilos is the, is the target. And the flying benefits, obviously, with the use. Um, so we, we, when we did our transex with Paul, uh, we found that we had a reasonable bit more. We had shitloads more than Swinburne. Um, we had about 13% of clover. So um, we, um, we decided that there's enough to start with. Let's try and use some management to try and promote that. And you know, let's see if we can get that up to 30 or 40%. Um, so I've talked about that other stuff around the resilience going into a dry summer, but um, the, the idea behind this trial is also, you know, get people to have a look at your system, um, move away from the norm, uh, you know, reducing reducing numbers by a certain amount um, isn't really going to have a massive impact on your business, but it, um, it can actually have a real positive as, I guess, um, what Rob's numbers were showing, there's huge gains to be made there, um, and some of the analysis we had done by Baker Ag and Marston uh, showed some really positive um, outcomes. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a good environmental story too. Uh, we've got to be conscious of obviously the way we're perceived in, the, uh, uh, in our image, you know, more and more stuff like uh, promoting this and the natural end and less end and that type of thing going on has got to be a good look going forward. Um, so we did two, two trials. The first part of the trial is the NECAL trial, um, and that was just uh, where we, we took a section of 60 metres by 60 metres and we introduced uh, five different um, species into it. We did use a light desiccation just to give these uh, um, species a bit of a chance to, um, to really get away, but it, within the, that area we did have a, 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 um, a piece where it wasn't, what didn't have any chemical applied just to compare obviously as a control. So we applied the seed in May and then a bit of hoof and toofin with some tutus. Um, and then back in October 2017, this is uh, um, obviously springtime. You can see set sock ewes around the um, around the trial area, and um, those are the varieties um, there. So um, yep, just another view looking up into it. So we sowed. Uh, we started off with eight kilos of Balanza. So that's the aerial seeding one that um, Paul referred to earlier. We did eight kilos of a red white clover brew. Uh, six kilos to the hectare of arrow leaf, and then 12 kilos of subclover, um, a combination of two, two subclovers. And right next to that, we thought we'll go full noise, we'll go 120 kilos of subclover. Uh, the reason behind that is that the arrow leaf and the balanza seeds are so, so tiny to get the same equivalent amount of seed into um, that area, that was the rate that it would go at. And that looks awesome. Um, so just uh, quickly, the growth rates across those, I guess, you know, briefly, you can see by adding these clovers into your system, there's a dramatic increase in growth rates from early September through to pretty much the 9th of, um, you know, November, um, comparing to what was there at 15 kilos um, in the control area. 
Um, this, this, this is just showing basically again the uh, the growth rates, or sorry, the, the percentage of clover in each of these. So um, the arrow leaf was obviously very dominant, um, but all, all of them um, produced quite a lot. But I guess the most encouraging thing for us is that without using spray, we were still able to lift our, uh, lift our amounts from 15 there right through up into the sort of around that 60% clover, which um, that to me is really encouraging and shows that, you know, chemicals add a bit, but they um, obviously add cost and there's other risks that go with it. So the second part of our trial um, was all around the management. Like I said, we had a reasonable amount of clover in our, in our sward, so we decided that we've got this paddock here, Hughes, it's a pretty dry, gnarly face. Um, and uh, we decided we'll, we'll split this in half in, in May. So we cut it in half, and on the left-hand side, uh, the, um, the, the idea is to basically run the new management system to try and really, I guess, focus on key times of the year to get the germination happening, um, giving it a good spill, and just, um, I guess, taking a bit of that competition out. Like um, Paul mentioned, the, the worst enemy, enemy of a clover plant is a sheep. Um, and uh, so just through some careful management, we've um, tried to um, just graze that differently. So on the right hand side, traditional set stocking, uh, just, your, just your general management. Um, within the new management area there, we also did a strip um, where we sewed 20 kilos of um, a, a combination. We did 12 kilos of sub clover, um, four kilos of white and four kilos of red clover. Uh, we used no spray at all, but we did use uh, insecticide and some slug bait. Um, conditions were atrocious for that. We, we basically sewed it into a hard face of uh, stalky rubbish um, and thought, well, well, we'll give it a go, see what comes through. And, um, you know, if you were to go by a textbook, it was pretty much managed um, completely incorrectly. However, we obviously did something right at one point where we, we grazed it off and those seeds obviously made contact and um, yeah, we had a, um, had a pretty good strike in there and um, that's looking up. This is obviously in the spring of 2017. Um, that, those dark factors aren't uh, face or pieces aren't um, urine patches, those are all sub clover coming away. And that's um, just looking straight up into it. So um, yeah, uh, on the right hand side, it's just showing the, the runners, you know, some of these runners of, the, um, of this clover were you know, getting up to close to a metre long. It was a, quite incredible and I've got to admit that I went into this completely naive. I had no understanding of the, um, the life cycle of a sub plant and I probably just, you know, I've been really focused on, I guess, uh, learning about sheep breeding and fencing and getting my water right and all these things. Completely neglected the fact one of the most important ingredients in our in our pasture, the clover, and uh, yeah, um, it's been a really big eye opener being involved in this trial. So that's looking at the um, just the face in that um, uh, the Hughes paddock. So that's that's it doing its seed set in uh, uh, probably about November, uh, probably no, actually late late October 2017. Again, no seed has been introduced there. This is all natural seed that was there. Um, all those dark green patches, again, that's not urine, that's subclover. Um, and it's blown me away with actually how much is there and how hardy these, these, these seedlings and plants are. You know, we've been trying to beat the living hell out of them for the last uh, however many years and uh, they just keep on coming back. So back to that little strip that we did um, where we got pretty much everything wrong. I thought we did have everything wrong, but we obviously had some wet a favourable season and with some uh, good, good rains in the spring. But um, effectively, we lifted the clover in that area from 70, uh, sorry, sorry, from 25% to 72% um, in one season. So um, I guess um, that was just incredible. And that's not to mention that that 72% clover was then about to dump one, two, three hundred kilos of seed into the soil. Um, that there's just a just a quick look at the um, uh, the fence line between the two management systems. Um, obviously, on the left hand side, it's been shut up, so it's going to show more visual clover. But the the interesting thing is, on the right hand side there, where the, all the clover is, you can see there's actually pieces of grass. You know, so there's some reasonable there's rye grass and stuff in there, but 
the stock and predominantly the lambs, the ones that we want really getting into this clover, have just literally rucked up every piece of clover they can reach and they ignore the grass so you know how good it is, they love it. Um, Paul gave me a cage to just go and chuck out on the farm and um, I thought oh, I'll just go and pick a random northern face, hard face and see what's there. Um, and I was blown away with it, what actually came away when it was given a chance to express itself and um, yeah, it was a real eye-opener and um, yeah, it's um, yeah, quite, a, quite a cool photo to show that, you know, I never ever let these paddocks get a chance because they're always sit, sitting um, with tons of animals sitting on them and um, yeah, it's been really cool. So once we um, shut up in um, the paddock, it was um, spilled to seed set for uh, two months. Uh, we then um, uh, had this big bank of beautiful clover and everything, and um, it was like, crikey, what do we put in there? Do I put bulls in there? No, nah, I might blow them to bits. So um, I um, decided, you know, look, weaned ewe lambs. It's a, you know, it was a perfect, um, perfect area to go and chuck these ewe lambs in, and um, yeah, they look pretty happy. So um, it was uh, quite cool. So um, I know, I guess, common feedback I get is. Um, uh, you've, um, you're shutting up this area, um, you know, isn't that just a waste of time and a waste of production? Um, yeah, I, d I don't think so. I think there's, you know, we just got to think outside the square. There's other things that we can do to, um, to uh, make up for that money that you may have lost in that area, if not make some more, you know, but more trading, think outside the square. Uh, going forward, um, this is February this year, so this is the, the seed drop from um, uh, 2017. So last year we just went through a, back to our traditional management, so nothing different, um, just typical management, um, set stock use and bloody blah. Um, yeah, the burrs on the ground, I don't know if you can make them out, but um, again, I knew none of this before I started this and I feel like a real rookie, but um, all these little round things here, there's two or three seedlings in each of those and they're just sitting there waiting for that rain to um, um, come and uh, let them do their thing and germinate. So um, yeah, there's our first strike, or sorry, that's our second strike. The first strike came through um, early on and actually got smoked by the dry, so that disappeared. Um, this is in the Hughes paddock with the, um, uh, so no no new clover introduced in this area and um, yeah, it's just looking incredible. Um, I probably thought, thought these were thistles in, back in the day. Um, so the plan going forward is, um, you know, um, we want to keep doing this. We actually decided ourselves that we're going to do another 10 hectares and um, so a combination of clovers. Um, we're going to do 10 kilos with um, slug bait. And um, yeah, we're just waiting for the moisture. We've, we're pretty dry back down home now and um, you know, we're actually going to probably push that out to the end of May, maybe early June. Um, like Paul mentioned, we need a bit of mud and we need a bit of decent soil contact. So um, yeah, that's the plan at this stage. Um, yep, just continue managing the new germinations and uh, I've just been using wieners at the moment in the new trial area to um, basically keep the light open for the clovers to come through. Um, we use a bit of Farmax and FarmRQ to make sure that this all stacks up and we're not just uh, making it look pretty for everyone. It's got to, you know, financially it's got to stack up, so that's going to be really important. Um, I've just started doing some pretty rough and ready um, cell phone videos too, just um, to basically give guys a bit of a, uh, a monthly calendar almost as to how, how we're managing it. Um, I've been asked a few times after speaking, um, how have you actually managed the whole whole year thing and I thought well shit with a bit of um you know a bit of camera and stuff like that we might be able to just give updates and put them on uh, the beef and lamb website and um hopefully you guys can follow that and just see how we've tracked um so yeah um obviously we've got the bit of fertilizer trial there and um maybe uh, maybe this spring we'll see how we're going we'll have a field day otherwise we'll have one in spring uh 2020. So in summary, yep, massive uh, seed bank really starting to do its thing. It's really exciting and I'm um, really looking forward to seeing what comes out this spring. Um, obviously, like I mentioned, I'm excited about the um, spray um, without spraying, uh, the increase in clover content we've got. Um, and I just challenge um, everyone to think about the systems, you know, small adjustments to your system can be highly profitable. Uh, I guess like Rob said, and um, we had Baker Ag, um, Ed Harrison put out some really strong numbers as to what we could potentially achieve by um, lifting our weaning weights and um, yeah, just making your business a whole lot more resilient. Um, we've got a couple of videos that we've done with beef and lamb, um, just covering the first and second years. If we've got time, we may show the second, um, second year, but um, 
yeah, we'll see how we go. Um, yeah, I'd just say get out, have a look at your pastures, um, do a little bit more research on clover because at the end of the day, the, um, we love clover and there's no doubt about it because you see what your stock love and um, yeah, they absolutely love it. So um, yeah, thanks for your time today. Some pretty uh, interesting stuff and some uh, really thought-provoking information that these guys have actually shared with us today. With that in mind, I'm picking there's probably going to be at least one or two questions from the crowd here. What have you got for us? Yeah. yeah. Given, given the stuff around this clover, are we, should we be getting better off at just chucking some seed in with our fertiliser, you know, sub clover with our food every year? Or is that, is that something? I don't know who's going to answer the question, but should we be doing more of that? Probably do count here too, Paul. Um, my, my personal opinion on that I've tried that and um, I think we've moved on from that and you have to really target a paddock and um, get your timing right when you're putting on that seed combine it with the slug bait possibly insecticide and then because these are annuals you, you have to really think about um, getting them established without not um, overgrazing, letting them express themselves in the spring and the whole idea is letting them go to seed and knowing when they are going to go to seed and so you've got that seed bank going forward. Uh, the problem with putting on the fertilisers, as Rob said, it's you've, you, you just it, it's kind of hit and miss, but also you're paying $12 a kilo when you're putting it in with your fertiliser if you're letting the natural stuff do its thing and set 200 kilos of seed itself, that's a damn sight cheaper. Yeah, I'll, sorry, I'll just back that up. I've had uh, guys say that, you know, we used to do that and chuck it all on there. And I said to them, did you change your management at all? Did you, you know, do anything with the germination? They said, yeah, no, nah, not really, eh? So um, did you see any lift? Oh, not really. So, you know, like it's your money and like Paul said, it's a lot of money. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd be doing it in stages. I think we've uh, probably by and large covered a couple of those questions here, but I saw somebody had their hands up down here. Yeah, just with Richard, um, with that dew drop, was, was the management different? Was it just about shoving the, that rock up? Is that, that, that what all it was, or what, what did you do to get that big bank of clover for your unit? Yep, um, so to get that big bank of, um, it was just through the winter time, we really, instead of, uh, say, putting a mob of ewes in there for a couple of days, it was just like a really shorter quick, um, a, a, you know, a quick shift through there. So it would maybe, instead of two days, it was one day. So it was making sure they weren't really hammering um, all those plants. But it's just making sure that through that germination period, you get the, let those um, seedlings get up to that three trifolate. And once they're up to three or four, then you're, you're almost, you're set. Um, and then, now nah, all that clover just come away itself. It's all there, it's just given a chance. Um, oh yeah, we did use a lot of uh, extra cattle through there, but um, no, nah, we didn't lamb on that. And I, I reckon that's probably one of, the, um, one of the challenges for this trial is to actually find out where that break even point is. You know, do we actually need to put 300 kilos of so um, seed in there? Can we actually keep um, a certain proportion of stock in there and uh, still make a bit of cash off it, but get a good seed dump? Um, it was interesting, I put some cattle into that paddock just to see um, if they would um, touch the clover and you know there's plenty of ryegrass and other grasses in there. They just hunted for every single runner that I could and I was like, I can't do it, I've got to get you out. So um, yeah, 